You know, I read this book in under 48 hours and Brian Lee Durfee still got his review out before me. I probably would have beat him if it wasn't for that goddamned bridge. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bridge dwellers? Mike, back to talk a lot more Stephen King as we did have a new book this past Tuesday, guys. Fairy Tale by Stephen King did come out. So, uh, uh, early front runner for cover of the year. Uh, we've had some arguments on my Discord about what's better, the U.S. cover or the U.K. cover. I think they're both great, but I mean, this is like untouchable, guys. This is like this is like embossed. It's amazing. It is just a spectacular cover. I love the colors. Yeah, yeah, cover is just great. But how about the book, guys? This is the return to fantasy for Mr. King. It's uh, quite exciting. It's the first time since I uh, went through the keyhole 10 years ago. So it's been very, very exhilarating for King fans to kind of theorize about, to uh, discuss, debate. There's a lot of people who thought that this book was going to be Dark Tower adjacent, is it? Well, we're going to kind of talk about that, but you're free from spoilers here, guys. I'm not going to give you too much away, but I'm going to kind of let you know what you need to know going into this book. So uh, this was probably my highest expectations for a King book since the Institute came out about three years ago now at least and uh did it did it beat those expectations well we're going to get into it guys we're going to begin like usual by discussing what is this book about now charlie reed looks like a regular high school kid but he carries a heavy load when his mom is killed in a hit and run accident when he was 10 and grief drove his dad to drink charlie learned how to take care of himself and his dad then when charlie is 17 he meets howard bowditch a recluse with a big dog and a big house at the top of a big hill in the backyard is a locked shed from which strange sounds emerge, as if something is trying to escape. Mr. Bowditch leaves Charlie a cassette tape telling a story that is impossible to believe and a responsibility far too massive for the boy to shoulder. Because within the shed is a portal to another world, one whose denizens are in peril and whose monstrous leaders may destroy their own world and ours. In this parallel universe where two moons race across the sky and the grand towers of a sprawling palace pierce the clouds, there are exiled princesses and princes who suffer horrific punishments. There are dungeons, there are games in which men and women must fight each other to the death for the amusement of the fair one. And there is a rumored magic sundial that can turn back time. Guys, that takes us into the brand new King novel 2022. This is Fairy Tale. Mm hmm. Now, where do we begin? Well, we begin with what makes it good or bad. We're going to start with the good here, guys. Coming of age, slice of life. That's what King's bread and butter is to me. I think no one does this better. No one else can tell me about the day-to-day -day routine of a normal teenage kid and make it just spectacular. He continues to do that, guys. He is still the king in that regard. No one else can do it better than him. He does it for about half of this book. You're going to be living the life with Charlie through the good times and the bad. You're going to be kind of goosing how this kid copes with the shitty hand that he has been dealt. And I think that anyone who's dealt with uh, an alcoholic parent or a dysfunctional family, uh, a broken family, anything like that, I think you're going to find lots of things to relate to with Charlie here. And I never had an alcoholic parent, thank God, but I did come from, you know, from a divorced family, dysfunctional family, a lot of time alone as a kid. So I can see a lot of these things that Charlie is going through. I can kind of relate to a lot of them. So it's very, very tough to read, uh, especially early on uh, when he is describing, you know, that incident that kind of breaks his family. It's it's awful. It's, it's horrible to read. But again, I think that King always can set the stage for what someone is going through in something like this. And he does it just, just brilliantly here. So I, I think right off the bat, you're, you're on Charlie's side. You really want to see this kid succeed, obviously, because it's the type of, of life where you're pretty much behind the eight ball. You don't, you don't, you're, you don't have much of a future. And uh, seeing Charlie try to struggle through that actually is something I think that makes him quite relatable early on. I think the biggest thing here, guys, is there an animal companion. If you are interested in things like that, I know that I am. There is a German shepherd in here named Radar that you will find yourself endeared to rather quickly. <laughs> rather, rather quickly. Uh, but uh, I think if you've ever had like, uh, I mean, most of us have, if you've ever had a dog that's been in the family for a long time 
and it's probably let's just say to the point where they probably you probably should it would be responsible for you to put them down but you just can't kind of thing i think this might actually tug at your heart shrinks a little bit like i think of uh, my doberman pincher i had cleo i had her for 14 years and probably at about 12 i probably should have put her down but i was so selfish i didn't and it really took me coming to grips with the fact that she is suffering and you're not helping with that for me to finally do that. If you've gone through something like that, I, I feel like that this character and this situation is really, really going to grab you by the heartstrings and really just you know, just bungee jump off of those heartstrings. So uh, there's, there's lots of things I think that you will be able to relate to with Charlie and obviously what Charlie's going through with Radar here. If you're talking about King, you got to talk about characters, right? And I think he not only does characters well here, he does character relationships well first you got charlie and mr bowditch it's one of those things that king is able to write where he can write a young or teenage kid uh talking to someone from you know a much earlier generation than them uh, a, a older person and the conversations they have are believable you know just kind of coming to terms with uh this is the way it was for me this is the way it is now wow look at these advancements in technology whoa what was it like back then things that you would think it isn't just like okay boomer or nothing it isn't anything making fun of anything of each other's generation it's just uh genuine and seeing that you know we can communicate and share you know different things with each other because you know charlie loves to read uh you know and uh, i think that mr bowditch is like amazed you know when he sees like hd television you know things like that i, I think those are things that are just kind of charming i think I think someone on my Discord actually said this is almost like the more charming version of uh, Dusander and oh God, well, I, I can't remember his name from At Pupil. It's the complete polar opposite of that, you know. But uh, he is able to write that relationship kind of very, very well. I kind of touched on it a minute ago, Charlie and Radar. This is pretty much the one-two duo that you're going to come to really love and root for in this story, and it's hard not to. I mean, I think that a dog is already a cheat code. It's easy for us as a reader to love the dog, right? You love the animal companion. But, uh, you know, it's almost amazing how King can almost give a voice to this dog with who doesn't actually have a voice. You know, this is a fantasy book, guys. It's not that fantastical, right? But uh, yeah, I, I really do think that Radar is very much a very important character in this that you will think is pretty much like the co-star of this book. And again, without muttering a word, that is quite, quite exciting that he's able to do that. And I think the big one here is Charlie and his father. They go through ups and downs together. And I, I think it's kind of a positive message and that, guys, it's never too late to turn your life around. That's something that I actually quite admire. Because you think about, like, some of King's earlier stories like this, which he's always going to kind of... I think he, for him, it is getting his demons out, writing about someone who was too far gone. Probably felt like they were too far gone with, with alcohol or drug abuse and actually making it all the way back, you know, and getting sober and, and turning your life around. So I think that's therapeutic to him to get these things out and doing that. Uh, I feel like you're always going to have a character like Charlie's father in this one in that uh, you're going to see a lot of King writing himself into that character. I think you see King writing a lot of himself, not only into Charlie, not only into uh, Charlie's father, but also into Mr. Bowditch. Uh, I, I do think there is a lot of King in Mr. Bowditch where, you know, it is how he would probably talk to a kid of Charlie's age. So King's always going to be a personable writer like that. He's always going to kind of write some of his own life experiences, some of his own character traits into a book. I, that's just that's just what he does. It's something that he's very, very great at. And it does it, it continues to do so here. Uh, his love letter, I always say this book is a love letter due to like grim fairy tales and H.P. Lovecraft. It's very, very clear that those are some of his influences. I mean, the dedication here is to Robert E. Howard, is to Edgar Rice Burroughs, and to H.P. Lovecraft. I can see a little bit of some of those stories all in here, as well as some of those more famous fairy tales that I think that you guys might recognize. They're not quite as on the nose, you think. I mean, there's like references to like Jack and the Beanstalk, the old woman who lived in the shoe was up. There are some you might actually have to dig to kind of understand what the reference that he's making, but it actually makes for a lot of fun. Personally, I didn't grow up on Grim Fairy Tales. That was much, much later in life when I learned that, oh, yeah, they're not like Disney at all, huh? You know, so it does kind of touch on that they are a lot darker and stuff. And he, he talks about those, he talks about Rumpelstiltskin, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, all that stuff. He talks about some of those in some really, really sadistic ways. But guys, that's just how they were originally written, you know. But uh, he does make references to those things as well as kind of putting them into his own little fantasy world here. Uh, many, many chapters, I got to say, I feel like Charlie... His thoughts to himself is just King talking about the horror books that influenced him. Personally, I'm here for that. I, I love that kind of stuff. Like he 
He does take a shot at R.L. Stein <laughs> at one point, uh, which was amusing, uh, I think. I, I, I hope no one, I mean, I, I posted a picture of that and some people were like really, really snarky about it. And I was like, I, I hope you're not taking that too seriously, obviously, the way that it's written in there. Besides, he should have took the shot at Dean Koontz anyway, right? But <laughs> but he talks about that. He talks about like how he discovered H.P. Lovecraft and things like that. And it's very much King talking about how he discovered H.P. Lovecraft, I believe. And it's great stuff. I, I love those kind of character moments that make this character more relatable to someone like me who also loves H.P. Lovecraft and Edgar Rice Burroughs and Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury is huge in this, guys. He talks about one of my favorite horror books of all time, one of the earliest ones that I reviewed on this channel, Something Wicked This Way Comps. See, that is very, very prevalent in this story. And it's, it's, it's kind of nice to have that confirmation that when I reviewed Something Wicked This Way Comes, I said, I feel almost like Greentown is kind of like his influence for Castle Rock. It almost feels like a lot of the things in that book are some of the influence that King put into his own work. So it feels great to kind of have that confirmation that he does indeed love this story. And it would be hard to imagine a horror writer as, as famous as Stephen King not being influenced by Ray Bradbury, especially something wicked this way comes. So that was really, really cool. And uh, I think this is the most he touches on cosmic horror maybe ever. I know there some people think that, you know, there was some in Revival, but not like this. I mean, this is, we were talking about uh, tentacly Lovecraft cosmic horror here. He really does get into that stuff, and it's really, really good. It is really, really cool. If you've, if you've read a lot of Lovecraft stuff, you're going to get a lot. You don't need to. You don't need to. That's the thing about it. You don't need to read any Lovecraft to know these things, but it really is cool little Easter eggs, I think, that you'll find if you've read a lot of Lovecraft because he is very, very liberal with throwing those out there in this book. And personally, I think it's really, really great. I think it does have a strong ending, I know everybody loves to, to rag on Stephen King's ending. It has a strong ending with the themes of doing the right thing, no matter how hard it is. Doing the right thing is obviously going to be the most important. And, you know, uh, with Charlie, a, a lot of these things, is like you'll learn that, you know what, he's not the white knight. He's not the, the Disney prince that they try to make him out to be sometimes. There is a lot of things that he's done in his past, just like we all have. But it shows, that, you know what, just like his dad, you can turn things around, you know. And I think that's a very, very prevalent message in here that is very, very positive, and I really did like the way that this story ends. But, guys, it's not all great. There are some things I would say uh, not so good. Now, these aren't necessarily bad. These aren't necessarily going to be things that you don't like. These are some things maybe that kind of stuck in my crawl a little bit. Second half of the book, guys, is not nearly as good as the first. Uh, I, I would say... Your mileage is going to vary on this. It depends on how you feel about King's slice of life stuff. If you don't like that, you're not going to like the first half of this book because it is all just slice of life. It is just building these relationships between these characters before you even touch on anything fantastical. So personally, I love that stuff. When the book does kind of shift to the fantastical stuff, uh, I'm okay with it, but it's a decision that he makes at about the 60% mark where he introduces about a dozen new characters and he subtracts some others from the story. And I'd be fine with that if it was brief, but it's for like basically the rest of the book. And that really took this where I was thinking this was book of the year material to, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, that's kind of where I went with it. So it very much, I didn't really care for that shift in the storyline, but uh, it is very quite mixed. A lot of people on my Discord actually like it quite a bit. They have no problems with it. And there's some that kind of are on my side. You know, they feel like they like the first, you know, 60% or so better than the last 40%. But, you know, again, I do think it had a very strong ending. So uh, I would say that, you know, 75% of this book, I really like a quarter of it. I probably didn't. And I wouldn't even go as far as say I didn't like it. It's just, it wasn't what I wanted. I really was liking where it was going at first, uh, what that quest was. And then you got like this whole new quest and it's like, ah, okay. I don't know how I feel about this, but uh, yeah, how you feel about those new characters that he introduces is probably how you're going to feel overall about this book. Uh, if you really do like those new characters he introduces, you're probably going to enjoy it. For uh, someone who is as amazing at character work as King is, I never quite clicked with these new characters. You know, I just wanted Charlie and Radar. I just wanted that to be like the thing. And it really kind of got away from that after, you know, a certain point of the book. So that really, really brought me down a little bit. So uh, I think uh, another thing is that some people might get frustrated if you're not the big slice of life guy like I am with King. Uh, something that might frustrate you is it's over the halfway point before we do the whole portal fantasy thing. 
So again, if you're if you're thinking you know page one, you're going to be in a fantasy world, not quite, guys. You're pretty much in like page 300 before any of this stuff happens. And also, I'm not going to confirm or deny if this is a Dark Tower book because I don't want to ruin that for you. I guess I'll just put it like th this way. A lot of people have asked me, do I need to read anything else Stephen King before I read this? No, you don't. You can go in this completely as your first Stephen King book and you'll be fine. So I feel like that should answer that question for you. There are going to be references I think that you will get if you are a constant reader or if you are a tower junkie. But uh, yeah, I, you don't have to read Dark Tower. You don't have to read anything else before you read this. I think you could dive right into it. So uh, some people would consider that a bad thing. I think it's kind of like to me where I wanted the Institute to be like a sequel to Firestarter and it wasn't. Uh, maybe I wanted something a little different out of this book and it wasn't quite there and that kind of added to my, my disappointment with that part of it. But overall, I got way more good than bad, as you can see. But why should you guys read it? I think if you want King to return to the monsters and the unusual, this is it. Uh, the last few books, I felt like, I don't know, I felt like he wasn't happy. Uh, I mean, he really felt like a lot of the stuff that he was writing was just a way for him to vent some frustrations. So I think getting away from our world and going to a different world really, really helped him because I like when King is happy, obviously. And I, I feel like this is really the, the, the way that he can do that is getting into this fantasy world, not having to deal about the pressures and the, you know, the news cycle of our real world that really, really helped. If you love the works of H.P. Lovecraft, and Ray Bradbury, I think you're going to find plenty of things to like here, as he is very respectful of those authors. Some callbacks to some of the greatest, greatest horror novels and fairy tales ever written. And if you're just looking for something that maybe is a coming-of-age portal fantasy with an animal companion, this is exactly what I think you guys will be looking for. But final thoughts before I go, guys. Um, like I said, this was well on its way to being Book of the Year material, and then it just kind of went to... I don't know, about chapter 20 is about when it kind of started to change for me to where it went from, this is amazing, this is spectacular, this is fine. And again, I'm never going to say this is a bad book, uh, not even close, guys. Uh, I would never call it a bad book. It's just, I just wish it had stayed on the trajectory it had, you know, those first 19 chapters. And 19, it's not a coincidence, right? Uh, I just felt like it just kind of changed directions, and I wasn't quite fond of the change of direction. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's going to kind of depend on you. Uh, he, he just makes some decisions I really just I just couldn't get behind, and I just it went away from what was working for me. Like I said, I've been okay with it, but for a bit. But it just it goes on for so long, and by the point that you know uh, some characters that I wanted to see together get back together, it's. I feel like the air has already been kind of sucked out of the room. It really kills the momentum for me. But uh, yeah, the best moments are with Charlie, Bowditch, and Radar. Those are my favorite moments in this book easily. I, I really, really love that dynamic between those three. And I think if I'm kind of comparing this to recent works, I'd say it's better than Billy Summers or The Institute, uh, but not quite as good as, say, Revival, uh, The Outsider, Later, uh, I'm not, I don't like to compare his new books to his classic books. I like to kind of keep it within like the last decade. So that's why I'm kind of making those comparisons there. But, you know, I love later Revival, The Outsider. And I don't think it do, it's as good as that. But I do think it is better than Billy Summers and definitely better than The Institute, which really, again, kind of similar, though, in that it started really great. And then it kind of just kind of leveled off as it kept going. But uh, I, I, definitely a book I think is worth your time. Uh, I mean, I can't say to bust your TBR for it, but it seems like everyone I know just about about right now uh, through the channel is reading it or is interested in reading it. So I've had a lot of people say they were going to wait and see what I said. It's worth your time, definitely. But I don't think it's anything that you're going to be like, I've got to drop everything I'm doing and reading it right now. Nor do I think if uh, you've never read any other Stephen King that this is the place that you should start. You can start here, but I'm not necessarily saying that this is where you should start. But uh, your gun to my head, guys, I don't usually rank, rank stuff like this, but you know, gun to my head, I'd say it's like a three and a quarter out of five. Uh, sorry, three and three quarters. 3.75 out of five is about what I say. It was going to be at least a solid four, but then, you know, that part that I didn't really care, off, care for went on so long. I kind of had to take like a, another quarter star off of there. So, yeah, so 3.75 out of five, I think is where I would give this, which I said is about uh, on par, I think, uh, with the Institute, but a little better. Just a little, a little better as far as his modern stuff goes. Just below The Outsider and Later, which I still think Later is one of the best books that he's written in 
quite some time, guys. So that was Fairy Tale, guys. What did you think? Why don't you drop in the comments and uh, let me know, and I will talk to you there. Oh,